Seven million Americans. That's a, a debt burden that, that can't be discharged in bankruptcy, as we mentioned earlier. There are lots of people who have massive guilt around their student loans. Hey yo, welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we can bullshit with impunity. I'm Austin Hayden-Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week we're going to delve into, I mean, what do you call it? Like a current affair issue, right? Not the publication current affairs, but an issue that is in the current political, social, political consciousness. Uh, We're going to talk about student loans. We're going to talk about the purpose of education, talk about probably some of the problems with certain notions that have led to the current student loan debt crisis, uh, particularly this issue of human capital that was one of the big tentpole initiatives of the neoliberal reformers of the past century. And then we'll kind of just see where the conversation goes from there. Sound about right, Troy? Yeah, we haven't done one of these in a while. I'm going to see if we can get an entire episode without you saying either deterritorialization or re-territorialization. <laughs> uh, what about like, uh, what is what is a consonant term? I don't know. I'm trying to see how I can wiggle my way around either of those You can things. use financialization. That's okay. What about like recomposition and decomposition? Is that yeah, just cheating? It's borderline, but I'll allow it. <laughs> All right, um, but before that, we've got no reviews on uh, iTunes, but just a reminder, if you do go to iTunes and you leave us a five-star rating and a review and you ask us a question, we will address that question on air at the beginning of the episode. And what else am I forgetting, Troy? You can also go on to Patreon and support us there. Um, There's several different tiers you can support us at and several different items or rewards or whatever it is that you can get back, including a monthly newsletter that we send out with a bunch of extra sticky leaves and shitty minutes, um, as well as access to the polls where the patrons uh, decide what it is we're going to do on our patron-sponsored episode, one of which we have going right now. So if you're not a patron, please join up so you can contribute to that. And if you are a patron, get your ass over to Patreon and start contributing episode topics, man. Yeah, because in the past the past times we've opened this up to the uh, to the people, you guys have flooded us with suggestions. But this time it's relatively light. I mean, maybe you're thinking that we will dip back into the old suggestions and include them. Uh, uh-uh, uh, motherfuckers, we need fresh <laughs> ideas. We need and, fresh topics. And if you Help don't us do out it, here, I'm just gonna make dummy accounts and talk about the NBA playoffs. <laughs> so. If you want Please, to avoid that. For your sake, <laughs> go to Patreon. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, and write in those suggestions there. Uh, you should have gotten an email if you are a patron to uh, to remind you to be able to contribute. So please do that. We'll probably leave it up for another week. Um, and then we'll do the poll of kind of like the three topics, three or four topics that we think we could best handle. So yeah. But of course, first thing we got to do before we get into our main segment, before that... We got to do the shitty minute. This is the moment of the episode where one of us gets to rant and rave about whatever it is that is chapping our hide. It's Troy's turn. What's pissing you off, man? I don't know so much pissing me off as this is a phenomenon that I'm very conflicted about. And I want to express the conflict that is within my soul and then have you respond to it because I don't, I truly don't know how to think about it or deal with it. I went to the supermarket at one point recently. And as I'm walking up to go inside the double doors, um, a bunch of adorable little girls ask me if I want to buy Girl Scout cookies. Mm -hmm. And I had to wave them off because I don't enjoy consuming Girl Scout cookies. And then had to proceed to decide whether or not when I was coming back out and leaving the supermarket, if I wanted to go out the other door to avoid (laughs) doing it again, which is... Just, I mean, makes you feel like an utter piece of shit, right? Or right. do you feel like an utter piece of shit because you go back and they look at you with the puppy dog eyes again and you again have to reject them? Mm. And I'm, my conflict is, one, I really, really hate solicitation like that, generally speaking, mm. right? I think that it's, it's, it puts people into a 
uh, double bind where you're almost, you know, in a sense, guilted to do something you otherwise wouldn't do. And that seems like an unfair place to put someone in um, without knowing them or anything, right? But the, the other end, I do think it's like good to support. I mean, I don't know anything about Girl Scouts if they have some of the same issues that the Boy Scouts have had uh, in the news recently. But like generally, these are going to be like good people. And I think that, you know, it'd be nice to support them and whatnot. And even if you do buy Girl Scout cookies, do you have to buy them every single time you go to the market? Like you're going to like, you know, nine tenths of the time, you're going to sort of have this horrible conflict in your soul, even if you do want to support them at some point. So I just don't know how to think about solicitation that happens like this, which I think is in the formal sense just wrong. But then in terms of content, in terms of matter, in this case at least, I kind of support it in theory. And I don't know how to deal with this conflict in my soul. So Austin, give me some therapy. So the best solution to this is the Ryan Gosling solution where you just buy all of the Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> And then you just give them away when you're driving down the street to people, to random people. And then they look at you like, did Ryan Gosling just throw a box of Thin Mints into my car? And it's like, yes, he did. Yeah, but if, um, if you're not Ryan Gosling, then you're just some creep who's buying all the Girl Scout cookies <laughs> and giving them to people. They're going to think they're like laced with drugs. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, See, this is, this is a general rule that I follow. Every single thing Ryan Gosling does in a movie is creepy if anybody else does it. Oh, that was in real life, though, not in a movie. No, I mean, or, or just in real life, probably, too, yeah, because he's Ryan Gosling. Just watch any Ryan Gosling movie, and anything he does is creepy if anyone other than he's doing it. That's oh, a general well, I guess rule I will you can follow. cancel my face tattoo appointment um, <laughs> from Place Beyond the Pines. Um, yeah, so let me ask you this. First of all, there's an immediate issue we need to address. You don't like Girl Scout cookies, or you're trying not to consume much sugar? This is important. No, I just don't generally like them. I mean, I'm not a connoisseur, so I'm not going to claim that I've had every single one. Maybe there's a special one that's just so good. Anytime in my past that I've consumed Girl Scout cookies, I remember thinking, this isn't that good. Wow. Uh, people send hate mail to yeah, I know. I, I'm going to get blasted for this. I, I admit, if you wow. have recommendations that you think are great, I'm ready to be convinced. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I love them. So... For me, it's different because I am already disposed to wanting them. Now, granted, I'm disposed to wanting them because they have conditioned me through solicitation to wanting them. So that's manipulative. <laughs> um, but then that's the power of advertising, right? So do well, you get the thing, though, dude, same... Even if you like it, nine-tenths of the time, you're going to still be on the wrong side. So what do you yeah, do the rest true. of the time? I mean, this is that, that, that liberal guilt thing, right? Like, do you feel this way when you watch those advertisements that are like, you know, donate to this charity or to this NGO or whatever, and they show you starving children? No, definitely not. Because in those cases, you're not facing someone's like face. So I can very easily excuse to myself that, you know, oh, I, I do my part, so I don't have to contribute to this thing. But when you're looking okay. at an adorable little girl's face and she's disappointed every single time someone rejects her, <laughs> then you just feel like an utter piece of shit. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll be honest. I think you should feel like an utter piece of shit, Troy. Yeah, I feel um, like I should too. That's the yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But everybody does. Can you, can you, like, from a utilitarian point of view, aggregate the level of feeling like shitness that's produced by girl scout cookie solicitation and it has to outweigh whatever happiness comes out of it at the end right i mean i'm not utilitarian so i'm not making this argument in favor of stopping the right. solicitation but you so could make that, that argument it's, it's a disutility it's a disutility is what you're saying yeah it's set up to be that way right oh god poor girl scouts um yeah. Do you feel this way with like homeless people that, that ask you for money too that are out in front of grocery stores? Like I got to go out the other door because I don't have coins or something like that on me? No. I mean, I definitely think I've given more money to homeless people than Girl Scouts. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> not that I have that much to give. But yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's different because it's, it's different individuals. Uh, I think probably – Homeless people have, um, I would guess, a, a more experience of rejection, you know, given the circumstances, whereas yeah. Girl Scouts have this like expectation, it seems like, of yeah. getting what they're looking for. 
So let me ask you this: What if it was a bunch of urban students that were trying to fund their traveling basketball team by selling? I, I would say that I'm I'm not paying you a dime, but I'm going to be your new coach. See, what I would do is I would just give them money, and I would say, you know, you can keep the cookies. Like, why don't you do that? Why don't you just give them like a couple bucks and just be like, hey guys, I don't want, I don't want the cookies. I'm not but. sure they can do that. Can they even do that? Because they probably have to like calculate the cookies per you know, dollar ratio or whatever. Well, then you then they can just pocket it and skim See, it off the At this the point, top. We've, we've gotten into a weird conversation and it's all awkward and the girls are like, just take the fucking cookies, dude. And I'm just going to take them and like throw them away or something or like stick well, them in a cabinet take, yeah, somewhere just, in my apartment and yeah. they're never going to get eaten. Just take them and give them away. I mean, the thing is they are expensive too, aren't they? Like, I haven't bought them, I haven't bought them in a long time because I haven't been around Dude, much. you can't but... give away Girl Scout cookies. That's like mega fucking creepy. No, no, no. Like to family or friends or work people or something like that. That's not creepy. You just stick them in the cabinet above the coffee or, um, you know, you give them to a family member or a friend or something like that. You don't have to yeah, like, okay, give I guess... them away to a stranger. That, that's a moderate solution, but the problem is still you can't do that every single time, dude. You can't every single time buy it. Yeah, I've, yeah, that's true. Hey, but hey, hey go, no one got the money for that, dude. No, no, you slip them on the shelf in the cookie aisle once you go into the grocery store. So you buy them on the way in, and then so you what, just stick what, them next Ralph's to... Ralph's gets the, like, benefit <laughs> off of someone else's labor? Fuck no, man. No, Ralph's doesn't get the benefit, but some person walking there gets free cookies later. But they are kind of like, oh, that's funny. Someone put them there for me. And they, they're not going to pay for them because... <laughs> Ralph's isn't charging for them. I don't know, man. This sounds like the beginning to a bad horror movie. I don't know. I mean, again, I'm disposed too much to like Girl Scout cookies to really understand your problem. So for me, it's just flying over my head. So I, you're like speaking a foreign language to me right now. Yeah, but, but, I do, but again, dude, you don't buy them every single time, right? Um, but if I don't, then I don't have that guilt because then I tell them like, hey, you know what? I've actually got a box in my car right now. I just bought some. You oh, know? so you just buy one, leave it in the car permanently. <laughs> So you cannot be lying when you're saying you already have a box in the car. <laughs> no, man. I mean, you know, you still try to act with a, a level of honesty and integrity here. You don't fucking scheme them. I'm not trying to, like, get yeah, dude, around the, the, uh, the, the, the very the fact that we're, relation. The very fact that we're having to go through these hoops tells me that the moral dilemma is just set up to be this double bind where there's not this is one of those dilemmas that is it cheaty from the good place would literally like freak out over yeah which is what i'm doing because i (laughs) choose my spirit animal (laughs) Uh, i love it it's a kantian man i know oh (laughs) god it's so good all right enough of that let's talk about some student loans yeah all right let's do it Yeah, so we were thinking about what to talk about in this episode, and we wanted to, you know, have a little bit of a break in between doing episodes on the Barber book we've been doing on our Parliamentary Book Club, and we haven't done a current events-based episode in quite a while um, that I can remember, and so we were kind of musing over on WhatsApp and what to do, and student loans have been in the news lately, um, both with, I think, Elizabeth Warren coming out with her plan for massive uh, student loan reform and, and I guess cancellation in a sense. And then also Joe Biden announcing today as we're recording this that he's running for president. And of course, he was instrumental in the, I believe, 2005 um, bill to uh, make student loans no longer able to be discharged in bankruptcy. Yep. And so it's been in the news lately. And you know, you have student loans, right? I certainly have uh, pretty cumbersome student loans. Um, yep. So from our experience, it's been something that's affected us. And I know a lot of work's been done in all sorts of areas, um, most notably of which I think recently that's been really interesting to me is the level of psychology, how uh, an, a massive debt burden affects a person's ability to um, live a relatively you know, stress, not, maybe not free, but reduced stress life um, and mm. make good decisions for themselves in the short and medium and long run. Um, so yeah, I thought we'd talk a little bit about student loans today and we'll maybe start with some of the, you know, economic and financial issues. And uh, I know you, Austin, are certainly interested in some of the, um, bigger issues when it comes to human capital and the asset economy and stuff like that, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point too. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think it's really important. What I what I think would be good is to kind of start with the American context, and then let's briefly touch on the British and maybe even Australian context, with which I'm a little bit familiar. To kind of, because sometimes people say, you know, the U.S. context is really fucked, and then some people say, well, here are some potential reform solutions that we're seeing in the Anglo world. Maybe we can, and elsewhere in Europe as well. Um, but in the Anglo world in particular, that we could maybe institute to sort of reduce these debt burdens and alleviate some of these problems that don't necessarily solve the problems, but actually just create a new set of problems, particularly um, the issue of income-based repayment and then like debt cancellation after the 30 years, which is the program in the UK. And then in Australia, where they have what's called the help loans, which are a little bit better in terms of their management of the sort of debtor um, relation, the creditor-debtor relation, but that nevertheless still run into certain limits. So it might be interesting to start with the U.S., then talk about maybe some of the reform proposals, then talk about like debt jubilees, and then kind of go from there. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is I tweeted this out recently. So if you follow me on Twitter, you saw this. But according to a recent report that was actually uh, produced by uh, somebody who wrote a, a, a journal and then did a sort of like talking tour, if you will, uh, on some of the, the programs released by the Wall Street Journal is so you know that this isn't like some sort of like lefty progressive conspiracy theory to try to uh, heighten or exaggerate the problems. But uh, 7 million Americans, 7 million Americans are currently in loan default of over a year of not paying their loans. I think the number that that equaled to was $150 billion of outstanding debts. you know what percentage that is of people who have student loans? It was 16%. Okay. So 40 million people currently have student loans, and it was 16%. I believe if you can do the quick calculation. But that means 16% of people, 7 million of 40 million, are currently in loan default they haven't paid their loans in over a year. We need to think about that because beyond the numbers of $150 billion, which is a lot of money, we're also talking about the, the impact on people's credit scores, their ability to get a car, their ability to get a home loan, their ability to get a reasonable interest rate on a fucking credit card. They're going to be subject to extortionist rates now in the credit market because they have been completely damaged by the creditor-debtor relation that has uh, subjected them now to a debt burden that they can't manage. And we're talking and not just a few people, 7 million of them. Now, if you expand that to people who ha are in default of six months or more, that number increases exponentially. So now you're not talking about 16% and 7 million people, but you're talking well over 10 million people. So, and I don't have the numbers on that, but you could probably try to find them. So, I mean, and we're it's talking important about to note really quick yeah. that that's a, a debt burden that that can't be discharged in bankruptcy, as we mentioned earlier. So right. you have the bad credit without the ability to discharge. Whereas, you know, if you go under on your home or something or on a credit card, you always have the option of discharging in bankruptcy and having the bad credit, but then getting rid of the debt. You don't have that option with student loans. No. And then think about this too, man. I mean, how many people had to co-sign to get their student loans, you know? Because we're not just talking about the federal student loans, uh, like the unsubsidized and the subsidized Stafford loans, but we're also talking about other versions of this as well as, you know, we're not even talking about fucking other uh, like private loans that people are taking. But um, there are uh, like the plus grants where they actually require you to have a, a relative credit rating in order to acquire, or, or in order to acquire the the plus loans, which are the graduate loans, right? Well, you have to co-sign for those a lot of times in order to to be eligible for them. So we're talking about people who have co-signed on these loans as well that have now gone into default, who are then subject to the consequences of the loans being in default. So the the splintering effect of this far exceeds even just the numbers that I already mentioned, which are already exorbitant. So I think it's just important to kind of recognize the, the problem that is currently facing us. 
Yeah, I think one interesting thing or one important point to to get across, and you know, I'm I'm not an expert in this area, so I wonder what your opinion is, but it seems to me that the issue of the large number of people in default and the huge amount of money that's at stake is very different than say what happened in the housing market from 2005 to 2007. Um, when someone who was looking at the housing market really closely with a certain theory of, of financial bubbles could have seen that this was going to have disastrous effects on the, on the larger economy, right? Um, given the way that mortgages played a role in you know, financial assets. Um, it doesn't seem to me like that, that's the, the case here. That's the specific danger with student loans, right? What do you mean why it's, it's, it's not the same? Just because I, I, the bottom, heard, the, the bottom of the market, the, the floor isn't going to fall out or something. Well, yeah, the the floor can't really fall out because one, you can't discharge in bankruptcy, and there's nothing obviously to repossess. You don't have the problem of people losing their homes. Um, the student loans or human capital or education is not an asset in the same way that a home is, right? That fluctuates yeah. in value. Um, so it's not used in, I would imagine it's not used in like credit default swaps and stuff like that in the same way mortgages were. It's actually auto loans that I've heard are the thing that are um, most similar to the way mortgages were in the mid 2000s. Yeah, I think I heard that it's something like 5 million people are in serious default in auto loans. Maybe it was 9 million. It was, I believe it was below 10 million, but it was in between 5 and 10 million people are in long-term default on auto loans as well. Yeah, I've heard that they kind of replaced um AAA mortgages as like the go-to asset um and securities but i'm not an expert on that so i don't really know for sure but i don't think so that's he- the the danger with student loans it's not about crashing the world economy overnight oh, right right well so here's the issue is that um in the uh in in the kind of governmental literature right now human capital is not considered an asset however there are efforts to redraw the boundaries in these documents. Um, so, for example, the system of national accounts is uh, trying to figure out how to reframe human capital so that it will be a securitizable asset. And so uh, one of the ways that actually they get around this at the moment, even though human capital isn't a securitizable asset, is that you can't invest into a person, but you can invest into the contract of a person. So um, one of the ways that this is being done is through what are called shared income agreements. So people can go in on buying shares of people so that when they go through uni or when they get a job or whatever, they have a share in that person. Or you know, uh, investing in IP is another way that you are investing into the contract of a person because it's knowledge production, so it's human capital um, that as people are being educated and um, basically they – they develop this IP, and so by investing in IP, you are investing into knowledge production, which is a way of investing into the contract uh, that is the product of a person or that um, relates to a person or somehow might even redefine what it means to be a person uh, as your human capital is being managed uh, – or as you're managing, I guess, your asset portfolio of human capital in the form of like uh, intellectual output and things like that, um, which this goes to one of the concerns of Milton Friedman uh, in – in in his heyday in the 70s and 80s as he was concerned as like how are we ever going to get bankers and private investors to invest in students because they have no collateral right Mm. with the house with the car there's collateral there's an underlying asset well what's the collateral with a human well it's the person so how do you take that person and turn that person's capacity into capital that can be an underlying asset that can be turned into collateral well you contractualize it and that is one of the ways that you turn the human person into an asset managing entity. And so uh, you can then get a return on investment that is basically paid in the form of the interest payments on the loans or on the IP that those people develop or you know that you basically just invest in the IP. But uh, in the case of education, you uh, derive interest payments on um, on the on the student loans. And then of course, as you're paying off, uh, your student loans over 30 years or whatever it is, uh, basically your job, your salary is partially quote unquote owned in the contractual agreement with the lenders that have invested into your human capital. So it isn't an asset in the same way, but there is there are efforts to redefine human capital as an asset through the idea that you can invest into uh, a contract 
Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've read a lot about how this this idea of um, you know privatizing student loans in such a way that it's kind of like indentured servitude of a sort. It's exactly um, what it is. Yeah, uh, is gaining popularity, and you can see why, right? Especially given the fact that right now, I think obviously the federal government owns the vast majority of student loans, right? They've been buying up um, a lot of majority of student loans over the past ten or so years, um, which in one from one perspective offers a huge opportunity, but then that opportunity has basically been squandered because the government, federal government, has basically been making money off of. Um, people paying paying back student loans, given the the higher the high interest rates and the sort of lack of political will to lower the interest rates or sort of um, take it as a as a federal loss or a social loss. Um, well, that's that's the issue though. Is how does the government account for these loans on its balance sheets? Is it a liquid asset or is it an illiquid asset? And if the loans go into default, is that something that they can just cancel? And so that's part of the reason why they hire private servicers like Navient and Nelnet and all of mm -hmm. these other companies to actually turn into agents that kind of, in a way, securitize um, and privatize these loans. So, yeah, the government owns them, quote unquote, but they're sort of being deputized by private interests, which means then that what you run into is this sort of tension, this problem between this, this feigning of public ownership but that is being serviced and securitized uh, on secondary markets. Yeah, isn't a big part of that because a lot of the private companies don't want to deal with the massive amounts of default, whereas if the yeah, government can deal with that and then just hire them out via contract. That's right. Yeah, if the government can it. underwrite it, then that takes away your uh, your exposure, your risk. Yeah, all exposure. the risk is gone. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so it's just another example of the federal government taking all the risk in an area and then these companies, these corporations coming in and just kind of needling and picking at all the bits of profit they can possibly get without any of the risk. Yeah, and let's reword that, is that the federal government is also the extension of the public, right? So, yeah, it's the so public it, taking the loss. Exactly. It's the public taking the loss, whereas the private corporations just benefit, again, because they're... They're given access to all of the gains and none of the volatility. So then what do you think about Elizabeth Warren's plan for debt cancellation? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, uh, at a personal level, the amount that she's prescribing wouldn't cancel my debt. So I'm not one of the 95% that would have the debt completely wiped out. Um, so, I mean, I think that's probably important to understand. So it's not like I'm like, yes, let's support it because I personally will be debt free. Do it's, you know the details it, off the top of your head? Yeah. So it's uh, $50,000 um, are going to be wiped out per person that has the debts, which will wipe off 95% of student loan uh, uh, indebtedness. Um, and it's supposedly going to be funded by a 2% wealth tax is what yeah. she's proposed. So, I mean... The eradication of 95% of indebtedness, to me, on the surface, sounds lovely, right? I think that that will really minimize a huge burden. And I don't think people really are aware of this too, but there's actually a large population now. It's not in the millions, but it's definitely in the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Americans who have fled from the United States <laughs> in – in 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 hopes that they will never have extradition laws or that there will never be any way for um, criminal prosecution to actually track them down because they've gone into long-term default on their loans. So I know a handful of people that I've met and I've read some various articles. There was a, a, a Vice, I think, piece on this a few years ago. But this is becoming an increasing issue where people are like, fuck it, I'm just going to go abroad and figure out how I can <laughs> – I'll never have to go back. And then, you know, it's like, yeah, if I come back to visit my family or if I come back for whatever purpose, I can come back to America. But there's no, like, there's no threat of criminal prosecution. Where I know is in New Zealand, they clamped down on this a few years ago where they actually turned it into a criminal law to flee from your student loan obligations. And oh, my so God. <laughs> there were all these people coming back and they were, like, fucking arresting them and shit. <laughs> what? So. Like, what, for, like, debtor's prison? Like, what the hell? <laughs> Well, I remember I was talking with a friend of mine. I'm like, wait, what do you mean? They just arrested people and threw them in jail for 
being in debt? I'm like, for how long? And if you're in jail, you can't pay off your loan. So like, what's the point? Do they just put them into like, I don't know, indentured servitude and they're like, you will work to pay off your loans or something? Like, you know, when you're a kid and you steal a candy bar and your dad's like, you're going to go back and work for the store or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, what do they do? (laughs) Yeah, that's crazy. I can't imagine that. I know. I know. So I think I think the consequences of this kind of this student loan debt problem are far beyond just simply, oh, hey, there's some people who missed out on some loans because they were irresponsible and, you know, they didn't live up to their end of the contract that they signed at the beginning of their uh, of their loan obligation, which is kind of like the conservative moral critique that's like, therefore, they must deal with the consequences. Um, it's much deeper than that. This is This is a much deeper structural issue. Um, that when we look at the policy prescriptions, we need to then understand how does this deal with those structural issues that isn't just simply like this individual moral thing. However, with that said, at the individual and maybe ethical level, the the plan that Warren has uh, proposed at a surface level, uh, at the surface level, it does seem like it would have immense benefits um, in, like I said, wiping out 95% of those debt burdens that are confronting people. Yeah, I think it's so, super important to, to talk about the sort of economic and financial um, consequences of wiping out that much debt. I mean, there's been a lot of work done on the fact that, you know, people who have massive student debt wait until much later in life to um, have kids and start a family if they do at all. Sometimes they don't ever have the ability to buy a house or have a car or whatever. And that, that really um, reduces overall aggregate demand when you're talking about this many millions of people. That's super important. But at the same time, I think it's also important to talk about this moral argument that yeah. is coming from the conservative side. Because I don't think that the answer is just to say, oh, well, moral arguments are stupid and individualistic. No, this one's just wrong. It's just wrong on its face. It's a bad argument. And we should, I think, try to refute it and rebut it anytime it comes out in the public sphere or even in um private individual conversations because it actually does affect people. There are lots Mm. of people who have massive guilt around their student loans, um, both from, you know, the guilt over, you know, defaulting and not paying back your loans, but I think even more so a sort of shame from these decisions that they made or probably made for them when they were 17 or 18 years old, that they had no idea what the consequences would be. um, And were basically on their own to make decisions about, what to major in, which school to go to, and all, again, even most importantly, in the context of um, if you've graduated in the past you know, 10 years, the great financial crisis, which drastically affected everyone's employment and financial outcomes in a ways that nobody could have predicted or no one was able to predict beforehand. Mm. Um, that I think we need to explain that that kind of guilt and shame is irrational. It's like survivor's guilt. It's not a rational kind of guilt or shame, and you should not experience it. And if you do, it, that's something else going on that you don't deserve. You don't deserve to feel that guilt and shame. Um, and I think freeing people of those sort of internalist consequences of this moral argument is an important step in gaining traction for the sort of political and policy areas. Mm. Yeah, so I have I have like an an analogous situation that is very personal in my life at the moment. So somebody very close to me um, is going through a really tumultuous breakup, and this person was in a long term relationship with somebody who uh, they built a business together, and uh, you know this is like a seventeen year relationship. They built a business together um, that got pretty successful. They ended up uh, purchasing real estate assets, and while they never got married, so in in the state of California, we don't have um, common law marriage, and so there's no legal guarantee of living with somebody for a long period of time that you would be uh, awarded alimony or anything like that. They call it palimony. Um, they have other words for it that that if you do kind of uh, long-term cohabitate with somebody that you might be subject if there were like promises that can be proven that you guys were building a life together and that there were guarantees uh, offered that you um, would have like a certain level of financial security or a life that uh, like um 
let's say, a quality of life that was kind of guaranteed and then that's that's taken away from you, then you can kind of have a case, but it's very difficult to prove, right? Whereas mm-hmm. if you just have a marriage certificate, then you don't have to worry about that. But so it's really interesting, um, the kind of technical details of this. But so what ended up happening is the relationship fell apart and this person uh, is now claiming that my loved one um, was just a, a sort of live-in partner and has no claim over anything, had no contribution to uh, the business, um, has really no involvement with any of the real, real estate properties, save one. Um, and even in that one that the person does uh, supposedly admit that there is uh, sort of a, a mutuality to, um, is now then trying to claim that my loved one uh, is actually due to pay back payments on mortgages that she has been unable to service because in the breakup, this person also froze all of their accounts, uh, extracted all of the money out of their shared accounts, completely cut her off from any access to funds, and also took away her viability as a co-partner in this business where she served as the office ma- office manager and bookkeeper and other things as well. And so I, I was talking with her and then in-, in-, in the lawyers and stuff like that, and I said, the problem is there's an issue of agency here. I'm like, this person, what he has done is he has effectively taken her agency away and then is now blaming her for her her inability to service the responsibilities that he has pushed her away from and taken her capacity to service. And so that's kind of similar what's happening here is there's an issue of agency. There's an issue of capacity here. It's, It's people have been pushed aside from their capacity to be able to service these obligations that they were forced into or compelled into or supposedly mutually brought into in the first place. And then when they're unable to service these contracts, they're then somehow being faulted for their lack of ability that they themselves weren't responsible for developing in the first place or they weren't responsible for not being able to develop in the first place or in in, in the last instance. So there's an issue of agency here that needs to be developed or that needs to be wrestled with or that needs to be understood. And I think that's kind of important to understand. Does that does that make sense? I kind of I, I kind of got lost in my train of thought there, but yeah. No, no, that's I was trying because I, I was trying not to be too specific and I didn't want to be like <laughs> so I was like this person and loved one, so I kind of got myself confused. But does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a really good analogy cuz anytime you have a moral issue when you're talking about blame and shame and guilt and stuff like that, agency is always embedded analytically into that situation as well, right? And it's really important, I think, to point out when when blame is being cast, especially in a like more structural sense, right? Not against one single person, but against a group of people. Even if they do not consider themselves a group, they're sort of blamed as a group. Um, if you see in there a situation where the person is not given the agency um, in which to escape that blame or to do differently, then you have an account of irrational use of blame, right? Then you have a sort of a, a sort of a moral mistake happening at that point, um, and that's a, a, a sense in which I think the moral argument gets weaponized. Right? Mm. People are set up to make these mistakes so that certain groups can benefit from it, and they can sort of keep the status quo the same because they have this linchpin of the of the person being themselves to blame for being in this situation when they really didn't have much of a choice to do otherwise, and that's proven by the fact that it's structural, right? It's not just random, unique individuals who find their way to this bad outcome. It's happening at a structural level to many different people from many different circumstances because it's built to be that way, right? And so yeah. when you have that type yeah. of situation, agency has been taken away from the person, and they should. And blame is not the appropriate response when someone's agency has been taken away. That's just... You know, ethics one on one, right? If you exactly. bump into somebody because someone else bumped into you, you're not at fault because you didn't have agency in the situation. Yeah, and if you do get punched in the face, then you have a right to be like, "Dude, why'd you punch me in the face?" Yeah, I didn't right mean to an explanation, right? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't my fault. They bumped into me. They pushed me into you. You can't punch me in the face because I accidentally bumped into you when they bumped into me and pushed me into you. <laughs> you know, it's you got to get mad at the person who bumped into me. But then, can you get mad at them because maybe they slipped on a banana and so it wasn't intentional? <laughs> Of course, if they intentionally did it, then you have a recourse to kind of figure out how to actually address the issue. But you have to you have to get your analysis of the situation of the cause effect relations right in order to make the appropriate 
reaction uh, to be a rational one. Yeah, and the situation we have here to continue the analogy and probably destroy it is, you know, the argument's probably something like, yeah, it's happening structurally, right? But these individuals could have seen this coming. Like you saw the person who was about to barrel into you. You could have moved off to the side and avoided it, right? But you didn't. And that's just in this situation, one, not not really effective because kids are too young to really fully understand that this thing is barreling towards them, right? And to make those sort of long-term decisions, especially given the fact that they they just can't be expected to know what the global economy is going to look like after they graduate and what jobs are going to be available and things like that. Um, but also uh, just the idea that you could sort of um, you could sort of get the lay of the land and make a decision like that is not a thing that we expect anybody else to do in any sort of similar or analogous situation. Right, it's a mm-hmm. totally unique thing to make this decision about a huge financial burden at such a young age, um, with really for most kids no real help in the situation other than family and friends who are usually exerting extreme pressure about going to college without much knowledge themselves about the financial um, situation that will come out of it. And and all just to say, it's it's setting people up for this failure on purpose. Because certain groups can benefit and they're totally fine and comfortable with the situation as long as as they benefit from it. Exactly. And if their risk exposure is negated because they're buttressed by the support mechanisms of a public institution that has its has its allegiances in favor of those private interests, then the system really isn't going to be threatened um Unless there's like serious political, democratic, socioeconomic restructuring, because there's no real incentive to shift. Because again, it's not that big of an issue. Because the private interests, they're kind of cool. They're like, well, as long as we can get, even even if the government can sell off their assets at a loss, you know, like eighty cents on the dollar or something like that, they don't really give a fuck, right? It's like, oh well, you know, the private interests are cool because they're. Uh, getting their securitized assets and the government's like, well, at least we sold it at a loss and we got something. So it's kind of in the end, there's, there's, it's really difficult to figure out what, what can be changed and how can we actually address this issue, you know? And I think it's worse if we're going to use that, that metaphor of like the falling into the person. We also have to realize that, that the person who is supposed to have seen the person barreling into them and they were supposed to then make the right decision to jump out of the way or respond appropriately or catch them or whatever. Um, But what if the person is physically handicapped? And I think that's the best way to kind of like extend this, this metaphor even further is, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And then not only that, the person that is barreling into them, somebody pushed that person and they pushed them on purpose because they knew that it would cause this, this point of tension, but they don't care because at the end they're like betting through some sort of insurance scheme on the back end that when that they're like in cahoots with the person that got hurt, you know? So it's something along those lines. We're talking about a rigged system here. So the person who caused it and then the person who ends up getting hit and then getting mad and then punching the person and then maybe getting injured, they're, they don't really give a fuck because they're kind of in it together on the front end and the back end. And so I think that's a better way to actually view this. And if for people out there that might be like, no, dude, you're just being a conspiracy theorist. No, no. This is literally what the neoliberal reformers would anticipate in their writings But they didn't care because all they were really concerned about was maximizing uh, the strength of the market through constitutional reforms, but also through a concerted effort to shift human consciousness, the public consciousness, towards viewing themselves as entrepreneurs of the self. And when you do that, then you become this instrument of human capital, that you have your assets that can be invested into, which includes insurance schemes, write-offs, and the abilities to kind of mitigate for the potential for all of these like economic disasters that come. So it's written into the very frameworks themselves at the outset that they can be supported in case of default or some sort of problem because that doesn't really matter so long as the uh, capacities of financialization aren't themselves threatened because there are mechanisms to ensure against, you know, the the, the, the floor falling out or whatever. So this really is something that needs to be recognized as not just some sort of accident of 
you know, like, oh, these people entered into a contract and then, you know, oh, you know, uncertainty happened and we had a financial collapse and that's okay. No, no, no. It's written into the insurance schemes that allow for profits to still be made on the back end in uh, in the face of those kind of collapses as well that we need to consider, you know? So this is fucked, man. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that the human capital idea because it, it seems to me that that really puts in stark contrast the two major kind of available options in terms of the big picture, like theoretical abstract point of view. Is education a social good that everybody should have access to that's good for its own sake and that is also good because it gives you the opportunity to do many other things that we consider important in life? Um, everything from science to the arts and everything else? Or is it really just a mechanism for preference satisfaction, both from the investor's point of view, right? Because they want to maximize their economic opportunities by investing in individuals who they think have the most promise. And then those individuals who have the quote unquote most promise are going to end up studying and working in fields where they can basically only maximize their own financial and economic opportunities, um, which means education is now a purely functional good, right? And it's a functional yeah. good purely for the sake of preference satisfaction in the end. And I think yeah. that puts in good stark contrast the options that are available because it just seems incredibly obvious to me from a foundational philosophical point of view that preference satisfaction is often for bad things. <laughs> and... Mm. Um, our preferences are often tainted and not good, and we often need correction from that. And a really good way of figuring that out is by considering education to be a social good and a primary good. Um, and it just seems to me that those are diametrically opposed philosophical worldviews, in essence. And it's obviously more complicated than that. And it's more nuanced than that. But you can pretty much figure out based on someone's sort of politics where they stand on that issue. Yeah, and I think this is why like Warren's policy doesn't go far enough, right? And there needs to be a consideration of how we can shift our concerns away from this increasing um, technocratization of all of life, but let's say particularly of education, w which is really the goal of the neoliberal reformers, right? Is uh, you turn the state into a competition mechanism where uh, investors are able to compete for shareholder interests um, and that that's the primary concern. So it's all about you know improving your standing uh, as an organization on the credit markets and so that's and on the ratings markets. So that's your, your share price. That's the primary concern. So I then, uh, if that's where competition is for a lot of the neolib Chicago school reformers, um, it's not about consumer competition primarily. But people, obviously, as consumers, are going to need to buy into this larger system of like the entrepreneurial spirit. So how do we do that? Well, we get them to buy into this logic that they are human capital, that they're little mini capitalists. So they're going to support initiatives that buttress the interests of private businesses who are then concerned about courting investment, which means that any policy proposal that's really going to contest that continuing trend towards human capital and the assetization of the economy is going to have to completely invert that level of competition over uh, like the ratings of assets that we then buy into with education just being one component of our uh, asset portfolio that we manage in servicing this larger sort of asset driven credit seeking rating rating concerned economy and that's where i think the war and policy ultimately falls a little bit short even though i think it would provide immediate material benefit for many many people the issue is is does it then have a proactive policy attachment uh a, a, a pro, a, a, I guess, a proactive policy initiative attached to it moving forward for future debt cancel, or I'm sorry, future uh, free loans, um, sort of uh, a transformation of other social and democratic programs that will ensure that bondholders and that uh, credit-seeking interests aren't going to just simply kind of sneak in in other ways. And that's where I think some people have been critical of Warren. Um, but where I think then her policy needs like a 
an and next to it. That's like, great, let's do that. But but what else needs to be done to make sure that that just doesn't happen? And then you're only just delaying the inevitable resurgence of a similar crisis. You know what so I mean? That, yeah, that brings up an interesting question, um, which we already kind of previewed a bit earlier in the episode. What do you think about the idea of structural debt jubilees as a sort of option yeah. for that more than just one time uh, Band-Aid quick fix? Yeah, you mean just, just like fucking old testament every seven years debt cancellation stuff <laughs> yeah i mean I, I don't know what the what the ideal um yeah content would be but but the but just generally the idea of it well i don't is know that a solution or is that just a kind of a, like a fun antiquated idea <laughs> it's a pie in the sky solution that's for sure um i <laughs> I don't know. Here, here's the thing. So, so many people say, but ah, oh, then what we need is some sort of structural transformation where there's like in in the future, like income based repayments. You know, like obviously you have the Bernie Sanders that's like free college. Let's do that. But the more like reformist positions are like, well, you know, what about like income based income based repayment strategies, which is what you have in the UK and in Australia. And let me just give you an example of why I think that solution isn't sufficient ultimately. So in the UK right now, um, they the sort of income contingent loans um, started under New Labour in 06. They were expanded uh, in the coalition in 2012. Uh, university, for people that don't know, in England used to be free. Then it went to like £3,000. And then in 12, it went to £9,000. Uh, in Scotland, it's still free if you're Scottish. But um, so it used to be free, right? But they then introduced that uh, you would have to pay fees for a university, and then they offered these income contingent loans. However, according to statistics right now, 70% of all people right now that currently have uh, UK student loans are not going to repay their student loans in full um, in their lifetime. Now, that might seem like, oh my God, you know, 70 years. No, but, but the way that it is is... Uh, is that you have 30 years of repayment and that repayment is attached to a percentage of what your income is and then after 30 years it drops off and it uh it, it it's it's uh, eradicated from the balance sheets of the government so the problem is is that the UK government is aware of this and so what they do is to try to mitigate that asset being completely eradicated from their balance sheets is they are turning to privatization and securitization to sell off those loans to these private servicing companies, like I mentioned earlier, the Naviants and the Nelnets in American context. They're doing that so that they can at least sell the loans off for a percentage of the pound. I don't know what it is, if it's like 70 pence to the pound or whatever the rates are. But because then at least it's not a pure loss, but they can recoup some of the value, right? But then again, the problem here is that what you see then is that the UK government isn't being incentivized to socialize education, but rather they really aren't in any way being challenged towards the tendency towards privatization and securitization because then they're actually getting assets onto their balance or value onto their balance sheets in the form of liquid assets that they can sell as securities to these private corporations. Whereas the student loans themselves are on their balance sheets as illiquid assets. They don't count as an offset on the balance sheet. So that leads to this greater tendency towards securitization and privatization. So that's the problem with income-based repayments, is that it doesn't really solve that problem of moving away from privatization, but it actually only sort of buttresses it. It actually reinforces it just in a different way because uh, private interests are able to kind of like maneuver around the structures that are in place. So income-based repayments don't solve the problem necessarily. Debt jubilees seem to be pie in the sky, but I'm not really sure what the viable option is. And that's that's what's difficult. Like, I love the Sanders campaign, free college, debt cancellation, let's do it. How do we get there? And maybe there's a way to transition from, like, income-based repayment plans that sort of, like, like, gradually move towards eradication. And then in 20, 30, 40 years from now, you move towards just free public college tuition, maybe that's an approach, but I'm not really sure how the institutional framework would best be structured to make that so that one, it's um, it's not going to then kind of like just create future enemies that it's going to have to like fight against in a battle that it'll never win, or two, in a way that would be sort of like desirable to satisfy people's needs in the short term as well. Yeah, I think that the 
the benefit of the Sanders position is that what it may be lacking in specific policy details that, that Warren may have in terms of you know, the wealth tax and how to specifically pay for it and things like that, that's all super important. And I'm, and I'm glad, really glad that Warren's in the discussion in order to provide a lot of that. But the Sanders position really gets at the heart of why this matters, right? It's not just because there's a huge drag on the economy from all these people who can't buy houses and can't get married and have kids and whatnot. That's an important point, but certainly not the most important point. The most important point is what do we think education is even for? Like what is the value of this thing um, as a society? And th that discussion just doesn't happen in politics. I think one, because a lot of people think it's dangerous to have it in politics. They, they don't want the outcome to be what they think it might be. But then also a lot of people just think we're not allowed to have those kind of conversations in politics. And what Sanders I think is doing and a lot of the, the new justice Democrats are doing is saying, no, we're going to have that conversation in politics because actually a lot of people agree even people who are on different sides of other major issues agree that education should be uh considered uh both an investment and a, a primary good in society and just having someone in the public sphere a major figure who's talking about it in those terms is so new and fresh and good I i'm just really glad we have both sanders and warren kind of taking us from from both important angles yeah. Yeah. Because I think Warren's plan is better than just the simple income based repayment plans like you see in the UK. But I don't think it's as good enough as like a full debt jubilee. So it kind of, I don't know. It's, it's, it is really interesting to see the two of them sort of um, as these outliers, I think, in the democratic, the, the field of democratic nominees at the moment. Even Can though. Co president? Like, I mean, so I actually I saw somebody <laughs> online to say today say that they thought that Warren would make a really good tr uh, Secretary of the Treasury if if Sanders was president, and I didn't like that at first because I was like, no, I I think her skills as a policy writer actually would be really pragmatic from the perspective of, I mean, because yes, she's a centrist and she's she's a kind of progressive centrist of the ordo liberal tradition, you know, um, but. We also have to be fucking realistic about what it is that is currently confronting us in the institutional framework within the legislature, right? Um, like, you're not just going to get Bernie as president and Elizabeth Warren that's going to be passing these fucking crazy progressive bills and it's going to be super easy. Like, there's going to be a lot of uh, pushback. And so the fact that she's still kind of utilizing the tools of the the private interests, like even in this debt cancellation, like I'm curious to know what happens on the balance sheets with those those assets. Like, are they just simply eradicated from the balance sheets, or are they somehow sold off into uh, uh, into like kind of securitized assets? Are they held by the central bank? Like, like what what's going to happen to them? I mean, if they're just simply wiped out, that would be great. But if it's through this two percent wealth tax, that's going to be a sort of like redistributional thing, then then that kind of has other implications. So, I mean, it's kind of like, I, I don't really know what the mechanisms are. And then, of course, passing that through Congress, I mean, it's going to get changed and rewritten when it goes back into the House and then bounced back up to the Senate. So what are going to be all the little loopholes that the conservatives are like, we have to have this if we're going to agree to this? You know, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. But I like the fact that she's at least kind of working within the institutional frameworks, within reasonability, Um that uh, that seems like shit can get done, you know, as much yep. as I would love t to see just like, let's just fucking push through progressive policies. Well, I do. the American system isn't set up that it's that easy to get that done, you know? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it on the podcast before, right? The idea isn't to expect Medicare for all and, and massive debt cancellation and free college in 2022, right? Right. The idea is we have these things now in the conversation in a way they absolutely have never been before. And that's super important. And if the best thing were to happen and Bernie and Warren were president and vice president or whatever, that probably means that these things become part of what may be like their mandate, but that doesn't mean in any way that they're guaranteed to pass. I mean, you just can look back to um, Obama wanting to pass uh, Obamacare as a signature policy and the incredible hoops that had to jump through just to get passed in a majority Democratic Congress, um, which and, and it also lost one of its major components, right, which was the public option in the process. So that's right. Yeah, you just with the American system, it's it's so difficult to really 
jam anything through, even with a massive mandate, that it's important to have our, our hopes, you know, kind of set appropriately. But at the same time, there is good reason for hope because there's these things were not in the conversation in 2016 and um, even when Obama was running. So this is this is very good news. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So fucking Jubilee sounds great. I'm down for it, right? Can you imagine <laughs> what that would do to the, just the the massive effects that a regular Jubilee or even a one-time Jubilee? Um, but I like the idea of the regular Jubilee because that would change everything about finance and economics. It would, I think, mm. change human beings down to like almost the atomic level. And I, mm. I don't, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's really good work that's been done on how impossible that would be and the amount of disaster that would follow from that. I'm not saying it's like universally would be a great thing, but it's so interesting to think about how that one change would just change, would, would affect everything that individuals do on a daily basis, I think. Michael I mean, you Hudson. would just, you would think, you would think about everything from education to your home, to your car, to everything else in a completely different light without debt hanging over you in the same way. Yeah. If we even yeah, had homes have, and cars, who knows? Yeah, I know that. I know. I was just thinking that I was like, it would, it would completely change the fabric of, of society. Um, Michael Hudson, the economist has written on this, I believe the book or the, the, I don't know if the book is called this, but I know there's an article. It's called like Forgive Them Their Debts. And he actually does a sort of economic historical analysis of Jubilees for people who are interested. Um, I don't know if he comes from a Christian background, but I actually found this from a conversation he had with a Christian organization. I don't remember if it was like a like a parachurch organization or what it was, but it was it was a website. Um, because, you know, he frequented the Left Out podcast, um, which, uh, you know, we had the, the dudes from Left Out on yeah, last yeah. year at some point. And he frequented there. He would do like the, the Michael Hudson Minute or whatever, and he would come on and talk like 15 minutes about the state of the economy. So that's how I was introduced to his, his research on this. And then you can find the article. So Michael Hudson, economist, talk about like, you know, forgive them their debts or something about debt jubilees and, and stuff like that. But um, you can check that stuff out online if you're interested in those things, people's. But interesting stuff, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. See what we got on your next game. What's up? Talk a little bit about our sticky leaves of the week. Okay. So the sticky leaves is when one of us talks about whatever it is that's giving us meaning in a potentially meaningless universe. So Austin, what's doing it for you this week? Um, God, I mean, this is like a really like political economy heavy episode. But um, so I have been a part of here in Australia recently, what's currently called the Climate Justice Collective. And it is a um, kind of uh, emerging community of people uh, that are based around the various territories here, the various states here, that are working together on um, social justice and climate justice initiatives, kind of inspired by the Green New Deal conversations that are taking place around the world at the moment, right? And um, first of all, it's just been really great to be a part of this collaborative community of people. And, uh, you know, there are people from indigenous communities from uh, local unions to national unions that have been involved, to academics, to um, local youth movements and various organizations just around that have kind of been coming together to try to tackle some confronting issues, larger economic issues, not just simply, let's say, the issue of uh, you know climate breakdown, but larger sort of infrastructural issues that are attached to these uh, increasing environmental concerns, right? You know, biodiversity and agricultural farming runoff and the negative externalities of, uh, of pollutants and things like that. So all kinds of other issues beyond just, you know, kind of like emission reduction and, and carbon uh, decarbonization and stuff as well. But anyway, it's a real fucking encouraging thing. I think I talked about this when I was in Ireland being a part of the political party that's called People Before Profit. The profits, yeah. Yeah. And that was like the first time in my life that I was ever really a part of like a real left, radical left political institution. 
And it, um, I was only there for, you know, a little over a year and I was only a member of the party for, um, probably about a year, maybe let but no, it was less than a year, less than a year, 10 months probably. Um, but it was, um, it was a really like kind of transformative learning experience to see a political party that literally calls themselves a revolutionary socialist party that also has people in the equivalent of the Irish parliament, which is the doll. It was just really interesting to see how they have both short-term and long-term strategies where they have boots on the ground that can fight against the government's efforts to impose water charges on, on people. Water is free in Ireland, but they were trying to privatize it. And, uh, People Before Profit and the Anti-Austerity Alliance and various other, you know, uh, the left-leaning parts of Sinn Féin were out in the fucking streets in the hundreds of thousands across the country to fight against this, <laughs> this proposal, and it actually stayed the hand of the government. It was amazing to see that. And then, of course, you know, kind of like the smaller local actions that were taking place over, uh, like, affordable housing and um, the, the homeless, the rise of homelessness uh, around the country in the wake of the... Uh, GFC, you know, Ireland was hit really hard uh, in Europe, obviously. Um, one of the hardest, them, Greece, Spain. Ireland got lucky, though, because they got bailed out a little bit better than um, some of the other regions did. But they still are, are really dealing with the repercussions and the fallout of the of the collapse. You know, a lot of their local assets are being sold off. You've got venture uh, or vulture capital companies that are coming in uh, in the form of like private equity firms that are buying up domestic assets and um, so it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem, but it was amazing to kind of see how they dealt with that. And, and then here being a part of this new emerging collective, I'm having a similar kind of joyous political experience. And, um, you know, while the road is fraught, as I've said, it's, uh, it's definitely been encouraging and people are working to kind of, uh, pull from all of these various intellectual and community resources to try to figure out how to, um, how to really engage at building long-term strategies that can pull the center left. Um, that That isn't just simply standing in the park with picket signs and standing outside of parliament and screaming. Well, yes, doing that, but also really trying at the level of legislative transformation and institutional transformation that it's really trying to kind of... Um, pull things back from the tendential slide towards the neoliberalization of all government uh, all government uh, procedures. So it, it's been really encouraging. Um, and I just wanted to again talk about kind of like how amazing it is to be a part of these of these times types of like on the boot or uh, uh, boots on the ground kinds of uh, collectives of people and and me as someone who's a little bit more academically and theoretically inclined, it's always good for me to get my head out of the clouds and put my ass on the ground, you know, and and learn from people who have years of organizing experience or who have served in politics. And I had a, a dinner party the other night where there was a, uh, he's a, he's like a progressive policy, or I'm sorry, he's a progressive, a political, what is it? He's like a progressive consultant and he has a consultant firm and he helps political strategizing for progressive uh, candidates and politicians in Sydney. And just talking with him and learning from his, you know, uh, two decades of experience is invaluable stuff that that me from reading, you know, radical political economy and political philosophy, I wouldn't glean from having my nose in a book. So it's been great. And I that love sounds it. Your, that sounds like your dream job, dude. Can you be a theory consultant? Dude, I'm not going to lie. Consultant? I'm not going to lie. I actually was thinking that I was sitting there talking with him. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, I was like, because I don't know if you heard recently, but like it just came out that I think it was Apple that has like a philosopher on its board or something like that, or oh in my its God, executive. Can you imagine a more like dehumanizing, emasculating job than being the philosopher I know, but at it's Apple? like he's like he's like I don't know, he's in the executive committee or something like that, but like nobody really knows what he does, and I'm like, well, that fucking sucks. But I was like, how could you do that? In a way, but for radical political purposes. I was like, that'd be fucking awesome, dude. The, that you, the dude at Apple's yeah. probably just some guy who like took a business ethics class. I heard there was a dude at Notre Dame who was like a really prominent business ethicist who left Notre Dame to go and be a business consultant. Do you do you know who I'm talking about? I don't know. This is like like a decade or more ago. And, he, you know, he left his like tenure track position where he was probably making, I don't know, 70 to 80 grand or 70 to 90 grand to go and make like 
well into the six figures as a business consultant traveling around talking about business ethics to corporate leaders, to the managerial class. Crazy. Well, we all know we all know about the revolving door between philosophy departments and business consultancy. So it's worse than Congress, man. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but I, I really did. I thought about that. I was like, that'd be fucking, that'd be kind of cool, you know? Have you have you heard of the Extinction Rebellion uh, group? Yeah. Yeah, they just had, uh, Doug Hunwood just had a couple of people from that group on, and I, I'd heard the name, but I wasn't really aware, but apparently they're they're doing a, a bunch of sort of worldwide civil disobedience to try and kind of shock people into climate awareness. What do you think about that group compared to like, some of the groups you talk about, like uh, PBP and the CJC thing, seem a little bit more um, long-term oriented and uh, more more widely. I don't know what you call it, like the, they care, seem to focus a little bit more on like the political, economical situation more so than just purely climate by itself. Um, do you think that there's some reason to prefer the latter to the former or do you think they're kind of both doing their own thing in an important way yeah so i've read a little bit not not extensively but a little bit on both uh, favorable and critical sides of extinct extinction rebellion um one of the critical things that i would say is that the importance of coalition building is so that you can develop long-term strategies while also opening it up to um, community concerns. So when you are just like a single issue thing where it's just like, let's just go out and do civil disobedience. Um, Glue ourselves because, to factory trucks and stuff. Yeah, yeah, which, which is, which is, I mean, it's effective in the immediate, in the short kind term. Kind of badass right? too, to super glue yourself it is. to like. It is kind of badass, but I mean, it's like it's like the environmental activists that chain themselves to trees and shit like that, right? There, there's something um, qualitatively more badass about gluing yourself, though. Than <laughs> That's true. I mean, just yeah, yeah. at a phenomenological level. I think yeah, because like you're out. like sacrificing your skin because you realize it's going to peel off. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but like one of the concerns is that it's not allowing for um these concerns to really take root, whereas if you are building more long term strategies then the community concerns, like let's say indigenous concerns or union concerns, can actually um, take hold of the institutional frameworks, whereas the kind of uh, immediate civil disobedience activities seem to kind of glorify or romanticize the event, the moment of disruption, right? Mm -hmm. The shock. It's kind of sensationalist. And, um, and even though you might say, no, but this is a universal concern, and so we are taking into consideration labor concerns, gender concerns, indigenous concerns. The issue is that that does this event actually cause the kind of rippling um, that you're hoping that this eruption would cause? And so those are, are the issues. And there are other there are other criticisms as well, but I think that's the distinction. It's like like and then of course some people are gonna be like, no man, it's both and, right? You gotta do the sensationalist stuff, but also you got to build long term. And yeah, okay, I, I guess. But um, the question is, 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 um, is how do you do that effectively? Because like, so we are, we are going to be there at the next climate strike um, that's coming up here next month, right? And we were involved at the previous climate strike, the pl the previous rounds that took place. You know, that the students led um, a couple of weeks back. So, you know, those are sort of civil disobedience, occupying squares, uh, shutting down traffic. I mean, it's not in the same confrontational sense as Extinction Rebellion. Um, they are intentionally being blatant in their public oh, um, presence. But nevertheless, there's still something kind of powerful about still having thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions worldwide of people that they leave work, they leave school to create a shock to the system. But then the question is, is okay, so what is this leading to? Like you can't just then go back to um, comfortably driving your SUV and voting for candidates that are only going to further deepen, you know, resource extraction and fossil fuel investment. And um, and then at the same time, is it enough then to then go and be like, well, let's support 
issues like geoengineering where we're going to shoot a shitload of sulfur into the air like is that is that the proposal so then at the same time you also have to really consider your long-term strategy that is being debated right now in the in in the kind of like climate justice movements pertaining to green growth versus degrowth strategies which are does green investment actually contest the institutional problems in the long term or does it just sort of like redirect the capacities for exploitative mechanisms to pop up in other ways which could even then not actually ultimately solve the emissions problem but just kind of like delay it or transfer it into into other ways so these are issues that need to be addressed that are the that the simple expression of civil disobedience doesn't consider yeah and i think that's you just mentioned the the idea that we the the shock value tactics may be entirely 100 percent sufficient in raising awareness and making people take seriously climate action but that doesn't give you any content that's what the climate action is and we're already starting to see, I think, as 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 massive change in climate and mass extinction becomes more and more inevitable, even if we do take drastic action, the sort of right wing reaction is going to be less denial and more acceptance, followed by eco fascism, right? Followed by much stronger borders towards you know violence towards um, climate immigrants, and so having these groups that focus on justice at a much larger scale is i think super important for when that when that right wing change starts to happen and denial becomes acceptance plus fascism mm. we have to be ready to fight that and if you have just the shock tactics as effective as those can be you're not going to be prepared for what happens when that change occurs and um if you have just the shock tactics but yet you hitch your wagon to the proposals of the center, that also is going to kind of be counterproductive because you're just only going to create spaces for private capital to be redirected towards uh, investment opportunities in, you know, carbon capital markets and natural capital, you know. I think it's called the Natural Capital Coalition that is this, like, coalition of financiers that are basically figuring out ways to create green assets. So we were talking about human capital earlier. Well, it's just natural capital. Same sort of thing, right? And um, we, we need to be aware that the imaginations of capitalists, while not entirely inventive, are very formidable. And... And the strategies that we sort of endeavor at the sensationalist and activist level, they have to be buttressed to serious long-term building that will contest the very mechanisms that have caused the problems in the first place. Because if we don't, we have both the tendency in the extreme right, like you say, towards eco-fascism, and then also the extreme center. And so there, there are multiple opponents that need to be... Uh, assessed and analyzed and addressed appropriately if we're going to actually genuinely deal with environmental and ecological concerns. Yep. Amen to that. But with that said, there's some really interesting resources for people that are out there. Um, uh, New Left Review has been kind of debating these issues about like what are the strategies moving forward. Um, there are degrowth Economists like Herman Daly, who argue for like steady state economy, and then there's um, I think it's Robert Pollan, who uh, is an economist who argues for sort of like uh, a sort of hybrid of growth, but it's not like intending for growth, but growth is the sort of like outcome of uh, of green investment. Um, and then you have people that are like all in on green investment as the strategy, which is kind of you know what you're seeing kind of take place, um, you know, like the Al Gore's that type, you know. So mm -hmm. um, New Left Review did a series kind of like working through some of these strategies, and I think that's really good. And then um, Truth Out has an, has an article about this that I've tweeted about recently. So just do some Googling out there for these issues like growth or degrowth and green climate strategies and things like that, if you're interested in this at all. And if you're in the Australian area, this isn't just a Sydney-based thing. Fucking hit me up because we are looking to build a broad coalition that is nationally based, not just uh, regionally concerned, but while also retaining regional particularities and concerns for the individual communities themselves. So hit me up and, and let me know if you'd like to be involved somehow in this collective, and I will let you know, and I'll get you in touch with the right people. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up the episode, I guess.
Yeah, you can uh, find us on owlsatdawn.com if you want to leave comments on our episodes. Also, a reminder that if you leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes for us and you include a question in your review, we'll spend a minute or two addressing it in the very next episode, hopefully. Um, yeah. Again, find us on patreon.com slash owlsatdawn to get the various uh, goodies that patrons get, as we mentioned earlier in the episode. And you can also find us on Twitter at owls underscore ads underscore dawn and you can email us owls at dawn podcast at gmail.com so that you can yell at troy for his uh hatred of girl scout cookies again again just pointing out i am willing and ready and hopeful to be convinced otherwise <laughs> cool well i think that's pretty much it yeah man just one more thing dude what's up bro das badani americanski yeah.